everyone, welcome to Cinema Net. Today we'll be talking about jaundice and biliary tract diseases. Here's the case trigger. A 35-year-old man complains of yellow eyes for two days. He experiences intermittent epigastric pain that radiates to his right upper abdomen for three weeks. The pain is worse after a fatty meal intake and it is associated with nausea, dark urine, and itching of the skin at night. You may pause the video for a while to think of the differential diagnosis and the history you would like to take from this patient. Here's the table of contents of today's video. First of all, we talk about history taking and physical examination of a patient who come in with jaundice. Next, we will look at differential diagnosis and also the classification of causes of jaundice in a patient. Thirdly, we will look at some important biliary tract diseases, their pathophysiology, and its relevant investigation and management plan. Lastly, we'll go back to our patient, our case trigger, for further discussion. Let us start with the history taking with a patient who come in with yellow eyes. First of all, we have to look at the chief complaint, which is yellow eyes. Explore its onset, character, progression. Is there any previous episodes? Its relieving factors and exacerbating factors? Its severity? And do they have any yellowish discoloration at other sides of the body, such as skin, the face, and the trunk? Next, we have to explore any associated symptoms. Symptoms such as dark urine, tea-colored urine, pale stools, skin itching, abdominal pain or swelling, and flatulence and intolerance of fatty food will point to diagnosis towards liver, pancreatic, or biliary tract diseases. We also should rule out um, infectious causes such as hepatitis by asking presence of fever, fatigue, headache, nausea and vomiting, joint pain, muscle pain, rash, weight loss, and loss of appetite to um, decide if there's any malignancy. Following that, in medical and drug history, it's important for us to elicit history of gallstones, hepatitis, and chronic liver disease in such a patient. Explore the medication, including traditional and complementary medicine intake, as certain drugs might affect liver function. For family history, explore if there is any blood disorders that run in the family, as hemolytic blood diseases can cause jaundice. Next, we will look at risk factors for viral hepatitis, elicit any family history of hepatitis, and for social history, ask for the travel history, recent food intake, as it might be associated with viral hepatitis A, previous blood transfusion for hepatitis C, as well as tattoos, drug abuse, needle sharing, needle stick injuries, and sexual contact for viral hepatitis B in particular. Last but not least, do not forget to ask for their alcohol intake. Explore its onset, when did they start to drink, their frequency, amount, how much do they drink in a week if they do drink, and also types of alcohol they take. We can use an alcohol screening cage questionnaire, which consists of four questions to ask for the alcohol intake. Questions such as, have you ever felt that you should cut down on your drinking? Have other people ever annoyed you by commenting on your drinking? Have you ever felt guilty about the amount you drink? Have you ever had a drink in the morning to settle yourself? Are the four questions included in this questionnaire that you can ask in the patient? For physical examination, we will take their vital signs such as temperature, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. In general inspection, look at the patient to see whether they are alert or conscious, if they look cachastic, any evidence of jaundice, such as yellowish discoloration of the skin, and evidence of leg swelling. A general physical examination is important to look for stigmata of chronic liver disease. Look at their hands. 
for muscle wasting, dubitrin contracture, coma erythema, and flapping tremor. Inspect their arms for bruises, ecchymosis, and scratch mark, their face for scleral jaundice in their eyes, parotid gland enlargement in alcoholic patient, and lastly, the chest for gynecomastia and spider nevi. Now, we move on to abdominal examination. As usual, we inspect the abdomen, their shape, and if there's any caput medusa in particular for chronic liver disease, any abnormal pulsation, or venous engorgement. For palpation, we include superficial and deep palpation, and also liver and splenic palpation. Do not forget to elicit Murphy's sign in such a patient who come in with jaundice. Lastly, it will be followed by percussion and auscultation of the abdomen. Digital rectal examination is included under the abdominal examination and you may find or you may confirm the pale stool if the patient has it. Cervical and supracurricular lymph node examination, bony tenderness and respiratory examination will be needed if you suspect any malignancy in the patient. Now we proceed to the second part of this video, which consists of differential diagnosis and causes of jaundice. Before we discuss further, let us have a quick recap on the anatomy of the gallbladder and biliary tree. Here's the gallbladder. It's a muscular sac lined by a mucosa characterized by tall and columnar epithelial cells. We have the fundus, the body, and the neck of the gallbladder. Mucus secreting glands are found at the neck of the gallbladder but are absent from the body and the fundus. Cystic duct is connected to the gallbladder and the proximal part of the duct is disposed into spiral arrangement called the spiral wall. On the other hand, bile is drained from the liver into right and left hepatic duct which is fused to form the common hepatic duct. This is joined further distally by the cystic duct to become the common bowel duct. This common bowel duct is four to five centimeter long and passes down behind the duodenum, then through the head of the pancreas to drain where the ampulla operator into the medial wall of the second part of the duodenum. In most cases, the main pancreatic duct joins the common bowel duct at the ampulla although it may enter the duodenum independently. The sphincter of OD within the ampulla prevents reflux of the duodenal contents into the common bowel duct and the pancreatic duct. It is essential to know that bowel is essentially an emulsifying agent that facilitates hydrolysis of dietary lipids by pancreatic lipases. Jaundice, also known as icterus, is the yellowish discoloration seen in skin, mucous membranes, and sclera when the plasma bilirubin concentration is above a certain limit. The causes of jaundice is divided into prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic causes. Hemolytic anemia is one of the famous causes of prehepatic jaundice. As the erythrocytes are destroyed, hemoglobin is broken down, releasing heme which is further broken down to produce bilirubin. Jaundice will then arise from increased production of this bilirubin. We have inherited and acquired causes for hemolytic anemia. Few examples include thalassemia, G6PD, sickle cell anemia, malaria, SLE, and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Next, hepatic causes of jaundice. Conditions leading to a reduction in the capacity of the liver to metabolize and excrete bilirubin can cause hepatic jaundice. Infective diseases such as viral hepatitis, chronic liver disease due to alcoholic, metabolic, and infiltrative disorder such as um, amyloidosis and sarcoidosis, intake of hepatotoxic drugs such as paracetamol, Autoimmune hepatitis such as SLE and inherited causes such as Gilbert syndrome. Lastly, we have post hepatic causes of jaundice. 
which is also known as obstructive jaundice as it is caused by a blockage within the biliary system resulting in failure of biliary drainage. It can be further divided into three different types, three different causes, which include intraluminal, abnormalities of the bile duct due to gallstones or parasites, mural causes such as strictures, cholangitis or cholangiocarcinoma, and extramural, which is due to extrinsic compression of the bile duct in pancreatitis, head of pancreas, cancer, and also Mirizi syndrome. One thing to note that is this Carl-Voisier's law, which indicates a non-tender palpable gallbladder in a patient of jaundice is normally not due to stones obstructing the bile duct, as previous inflammation will lead to fibrosis of the gallbladder in gallstone disease, and it will be that non-distensible. Hence, the causes of a non-tender palpable gallbladder in a patient of jaundice would be either carcinoma of head of pancreas or periampillary cancer. The diseases that are highlighted in grey are the common diseases that we will see. Let's move on to the third part of the video where we will discuss few common biliary tract diseases that are associated with obstructive jaundice. Apart from 97% of water, the major components of bile are bile acids, phospholipids, and cholesterol. Cholesterol is insoluble in water, but is held in solution by the detergent action of bile acids with the aid of phospholipids. In gallbladder stones disease, also known as cholelithiasis, the bile containing excess cholesterol relative to bile acids and lecithin, the solution is referred to as saturated and the excess cholesterol tends to precipitate, hence predisposes to gallstone formation. There are three different types of gallstones, namely pure cholesterol, pure pigment, and mixed. Pure pigment stones are further differentiated into two black stones and brown stones. Black pigment stones are black, hard, and brittle, found in hemolytic diseases, while brown pigment stones are soft and friable due to chronic cholangitis and blurry parasites. There are various factors that can predispose to gallstones formation, which include increasing age, hyperlipidemia, female with OCP use, obesity, multipiety, rapid weight loss, chronic hemolytic disorders, and gallbladder stasis. Clinical features include mostly asymptomatic, biliary colic caused by intermittent cystic duct obstruction by the stone, usually typically postprandial and associated with nausea and vomiting. There will be a febrile, however, if infection occurs, they will have complications such as acute cholecystitis. Acute cholecystitis refers to inflammation within the gallbladder. There are two types of cholecystitis, namely acute calculus cholecystitis and acute calculus cholecystitis. Calculus cholecystitis happens due to stones in the gallbladder, while acute a calculus cholecystitis classically occurs as a complication of major surgery, trauma, burns, or sepsis due to resulting bile stasis and poor gallbladder perfusion. In contrast to biliary colic, patient is systematically unwell in acute cholecystitis. Some clinical features include constant severe right upper quadrant abdominal pain, no sand vomiting, low grade fever, and positive Murphy sign, where inspiration with the examiner's hand placed low in the right upper quadrant can cause significant pain and prevents deeper inspiration for the patient. Ultrasound should be performed early, and it typically reveals gallstones with strong echogenic rim around the stone and posterior acoustic shadowing on ultrasound and other findings include contracted gallbladder, 
due to repeated episode of infection that can cause thickening and fibrosis of the gallbladder, pericholistic fluid due to edema, and thickened gallbladder wall, which would be more than 4 to 5 millimeters. Some complications that can occur following acute cholecystitis include amphysematous cholecystitis, chronic cholecystitis, mucosal, where obstruction of the gallbladder outflow with ongoing mucus secretion can lead to gallbladder distension. An infection of a mucosal can lead to a pus within the gallbladder, also known as MPMR of the gallbladder. And lastly, gall gangrenous cholecystitis. As infection and distension can lead to thrombosis of the arterial supply of the gallbladder. Gallbladder perforation may ensue, causing subphrenic abscess or generalized peritonitis. Next, in cholecystitis, gallstones are found in a common bowel duct, and they usually originate from the gallbladder. Primary ductal stones are rare. Clinical features include obstructive jaundice, laricolic, and if infection occurs, it will lead to complications such as acute cholangitis. Ultrasound typically reveal gallstones in the gallbladder and common bowel duct. Because of the gallstones, common bowel duct will be dilated, which would be more than 10 mm. In fact, small gallstones, less than 5 mm diameter, commonly pass unnoticed into the duodenum, but larger stones may impact the common bowel duct or the ampulla of later, causing complications. Classically, the alkaline phosphatase and gamma glutamyl transferase levels will be elevated in post-hepatic obstructive jaundice. Acute cholangitis, also known as ascending cholangitis, is a life-threatening condition that is caused by an ascending bacterial infection of the biliary tree. Cholidocolytosis is the most common cause, with infection causing stones in the common bowel duct, leading to a partial or complete obstruction of the biliary system. Clinical features include Charcot's triad, which consists of right upper quadrant pain, high swelling fever and jaundice, and Raynaud's pentad, right upper quadrant pain, fever, jaundice, altered mental status, and shock. It may cause life-threatening acute suppurative cholangitis, which must be drained urgently. Some differential diagnosis or other sources of right upper quadrant pain would include acute hepatitis, early appendicitis, pancreatitis, right-sided pneumonia, or pathology of the right kidney and ovary. Mirizis syndrome occurs following an obstruction of the common hepatic duct due to compression from or inflammation due to a gallstone in Hartman's pouch or the cystic duct. On the other hand, gallstone ileus refers to gallstone obstruction of the distal small bowel after the formation of a fistula between the gallbladder and the duodenum, usually due to inflammation. Cholecystododenal fistula allows stone to pass into the bowel, enters duodenum and obstructs small bowel, and gas to enter the biliary tree. This occurs in the elderly and presents as an unexplained intermittent and sometimes incomplete small bowel obstruction. Unfortunately, diagnosis is often difficult to make as the stone is usually radiolucent. However, it may be diagnosed confidently if gas is recognized in the biliary tree on a plain abdominal x-ray. Bouveret syndrome refers to a gastric outlet obstruction secondary to infection of a gallstone in the pylorus or proximal duodenum. Thus, it can be considered a very proximal form of gallstone ileus, but it's rare. Investigations may be necessary to confirm the underlying pathology. Blood tests include full blood count, urea and electrolytes, liver function tests, blood culture and serum amylase. 
So that count is taken to exclude any hematological abnormalities. Leukocytosis may be present in acute cholecystitis and cholangitis. Blood culture should be drawn from all febrile patients. In general, disorders of the biliary system give rise to the biochemical picture of biliary obstruction. A notable exception is gallstones in the gallbladder, cholelithiasis, where liver function tests are usually normal. ALP and GGT classically are elevated in post-hepatic obstructive causes of jaundice. GGT is especially estimated if there is doubt as to whether the alkaline phosphatase is of bony or hepatic origin. Serum transaminases are elevated in hepatic causes. Acute cholelithiasis and cholangitis can, however, be associated with markedly raised transaminases. A prolonged prothrombin time reflects intestinal malabsorption of the fat soluble vitamin K owing to a lack of bile acids. Both prothrombin time and albumin concentration provide a measure of hepatic synthetic function, which is particularly important in acute jaundice where there is concern about liver failure. The preferred first imaging investigation is ultrasonography. It can demonstrate the presence of biliary obstruction, gallstones, pancreatic masses, biliary tree dilatation, and liver echogenicity. HEDA scan is useful when ultrasound findings are equivocal for acute cholecystitis. This nuclear medicine involves administering IV immunodiacetic acid labelled with technetium, which is selectively taken up by the liver and secreted into the bowel. The test is considered positive for cholecystitis if the gallbladder is not visualized after 60 minutes, as this suggests cystic duct obstruction. Some additional investigations to be performed include ECG if the patient has history of cardiac disease or age more than 40 years and above, erect chest x ray for patients with right upper quadrant epigastric pain to exclude free subdiaphragmatic gas in pneumoperitoneum or right basal pneumonia. Next, urine dipstick to exclude right sided renal colic coagulation profile to determine if there is vitamin K malabsorption and liver dysfunction. And lastly, serum CA 19.9, marker of pancreatobiliary malignancy if high suspicion. In fact, supine abdominal x-ray is not required as only 10% of gallstones are radio-opaque. There are a few procedures relevant to biliary tract diseases. First of all, we have magnetic resonance cholangiopancreatography MRCP, is the investigation of choice for inconclusive ultrasound results. It is non-invasive and it avoids radiation exposure. It is also highly accurate, although it is expensive. It is preferred to ERCP if the patient does not require any therapeutic intervention. Next, we have endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography ERCP. It is both diagnostic and therapeutic in terms of stone removal, sphincterotomy, and stenting. Endoscope travels through GI tract until reaching point of blockade. Contrast is injected through a catheter into the pancreatic of biliary tract. If stones are found in common bowel duct, it is possible to perform immediate endoscopic sphincterotomy to release the stones. Sphincterotomy and standing of common bowel duct are frequently used to elevate obstructive jaundice caused by common bowel duct stones. Lastly, we have percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography. It involves the insertion of a sterile needle or cannula into periphery biliary radical with the use of imaging guidance, followed by contrast material injection to delineate biliary anatomy. PTC is preferred to ERCP if the obstructing lesion is near liver hilum or if ERCP is contraindicated in the case of previous gastric surgery. 
One thing to note is that complications of ERCP and PDC include pancreatitis, hemorrhage, biliary peritonitis, and cholangitis. Let's talk about some management for different biliary tract diseases. Oral bile acid therapy is used in cholelithiasis. Both chinodeoxycholic acid or also deoxycholic acid can dissolve cholesterol gallstones. Also, deoxycholic acid has advantages over chinodeoxycholic acid in that it does not cause diarrhea or elevation of serum transaminases. Combination therapy is the preferred treatment. Nine months of intensive treatment is followed by a lifelong maintenance if necessary. Shockwave lithotripsy is an expensive procedure. However, it displays good results for cholesterol stones especially if they are symptomatic. In cholecystitis, we should treat the infection with antibiotics and also along with IV fluids as oral feeding has to be stopped and energy cell for pain relief. Cholecystectomy is indicated for symptomatic gallstones and for all their complications. However, in young and older patients in whom silent gallstones are discovered incidentally, treatment is always the best solution. The problem revolves around the probability of serious complications in the future. The advent of laparoscopic cholecystectomy has swung the balance in favour of surgery, since this technique carries so little morbidity and very short hospital stay. Lastly, we have ERCP, endoscopic sphincterectomy with stones removal, in case of obstructive jaundice. In cholecystectomy, indications for laparoscopic cholecystectomy include cholelithiasis, acute cholecystitis, sickle cell disease, gallstone pancreatitis, and total parenteral nutrition. And on the other hand, some indications for open cholecystectomy will include refractory coagulopathy, suspicion of carcinoma, and unable to tolerate general anesthesia. Gallbladder cancer must be considered a contraindication for laparoscopic cholecystectomy. If gallbladder cancer is diagnosed intraoperatively, the operation must be converted to an open procedure. Now, let's go back to our case trigger for a short discussion. We have a 35-year-old man. Complaints of signs and symptoms of obstructive jaundice such as yellowish eyes, epigastric pain, nausea, dark urine, and itching of the skin at night. After a proper history taking and physical examination on the patient, blood tests such as full blood count, liver function tests, urea and electrolytes, and serum amylase to rule out pancreatitis were performed in the patient. Ultrasound revealed dilated common bile duct, without bile stones in the common bile duct, with three stones in gallbladder. ERCP with common bile duct exploration was performed. Although ultrasound did not show stones in common bile duct, but common bile duct is dilated. Hence, there might be possibility of the need of therapeutic removal of the obstruction because of the presence of obstructive jaundice as well. It's important to note that ultrasound demonstrating dilatation of the common bulk duct system, often indicating distal duct obstruction. Sometimes it is unreliable to identify bulk duct stones, particularly at the lower end. Image tends to get obscured by overlying duodenal gas. Lastly, the patient is scheduled for an elective cholecystectomy for removal of the gallbladder in view of cholelithiasis. Post-operative care for this patient involves proper hydration, wound care, bleeding and pain management. Post-operative fever most of the time is inflammatory in nature. If the patient remains hemodynamically stable, a mnemonic characterized by five Ws, namely wean, wound, water, walk and wonder drugs are important for us to look for the source of fever, if there is any. Green indicates lung atelectasis or pneumonia. Wound, we have to take off the dressings and have a look at it. 
check the wound integrity, press on it as there might be discharge indicating wound infection. For water, it resembles urinary tract infection, especially if fully acted catheter is still attached to the patient. Do a urinalysis if necessary. If infection is present, remember to remove the source, which is the Foley catheter. For walk, it indicates deep brain thrombosis formation in the patient. And lastly, wonder drugs. We should review the medication to see if there's any chance of cross-reaction among the medication given to the patient. Postoperatively, surgery can cause temporary paralytic ileus. Make sure the patient and the doctor hear the stomach rumbles as gastric and small intestinal activity appear to return within hours of surgery. Although colonic activity returns by post-operative day two or three. Burping and vomiting is bad as the gas is not going through and backing up in the stomachs, getting distended. This can cause vomiting and complications such as aspiration pneumonia or damage to the abdominal suture might ensue. For nutrition-wise, we should advise the patient to start with clear liquids, at once diet if tolerated, and soft mechanical diet, which include non-spicy, bland foods such as bread and soap. That's all for today's video. Thank you for watching. And do not forget to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. Wishing you a great day ahead.